What's up, everyone? Welcome to another episode of the Meran Podcast. Today, my guest is none other than the legend himself, Henrik Harlow. The man needs no introduction, but let's still go ahead. In his career, Henrik has won 13 X Games medal, including 8 gold. And he's got podium results at pretty much every major competition there has been in the last 15 years. On the video side, Henrik has created one of the most influential web series of all time, being the B&E show with his good friend Phil Casabon. He's accumulated multiple legendary movie segments with companies such as 4x9 Media, Level 1 Productions, Field Productions, and many more. He's also done a lot of self-produced movies, like 2014's Road to Zion, 2018's The Regiment, and 2020's Salute. Henrik is one of the goats of free skiing and it was a pleasure to chat with him. We talked about his 2022 season and everything that went into it. His approach towards an Olympic year, missing out on X Games due to COVID, the current state and future of big air competitions, and much, much more. Our talk will be split into two parts, so be ready for part two where we talk about his film projects and his brand Harlow Apparel. Big thank you to this episode sponsors, Axis Board Shop, Planks Clothing, and Adrenaline Urbaine. Also, big shout out to the patrons on Patreon, Will Cameron and Raf Diaz. Let's go. Mr. Henrik Arlo, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very, very much. I'm glad to have you. Yeah, I'm excited to be, be part of it. Thank you for letting me come along. Yeah, man, legend in the place. We've been working on getting you on uh, for a while, but um, finally doing it. How was your season? Season was good. You were busy. Yeah, busy, but yeah, it was nice though. Like not not too crazy. It was like pretty planned out before, so it wouldn't be like too intense, like not too, too many competitions and just wanted to have a lot of time on skis, on snow and... Yeah, it worked out good. Was able to stay healthy the whole season and was motivated and hyped. Because you had a bit of ongoing knee problems, right? Yes. So that wasn't that that's done with. I think you had surgery maybe two years ago, something like that. Yeah, I had my the last surgery on it three years ago. Okay. And but it's still like bothering me at times, unfortunately, because. I basically basically don't have any meniscus left in my left knee and all the cartilage under the meniscus is like all worn out so it's a lot like bone to bone so if I ski super much and too hard it gets pretty sore and like swollen so actually already last season I had to cut the season a little bit earlier than I normally do and it was Yeah, I think 19 of April, which has been like the earliest finish of the season for me in a while. But I was still feeling pretty good. But then I just like knew I wanted to go into this season feeling extra fresh. So then to have a couple extra months to just recover and get a little bit more prepared. Is there anything you can do about the meniscus thing? Like some surgeries or you just got to live with it? Um. Having a little bit more muscles, so support around it, yeah, is definitely helping. But I heard you can like have like a surgery where they go and like punch a bunch of holes or something in the bone, which can help sometimes uh, regrow cartilage. But for most part, it's yeah, it can be like a bit risky. So usually the physios and doctors tell me to not do it since it's working pretty good as long as I keep my head straight. <laughs> yeah, as long as, as, long as it, it's uh, bearable. Yeah, exactly. And as long as I take care of it and like are aware of it. So mm -hmm. used to like try to ski about like 300 days a year. Now That's insane. maybe a little bit less, unfortunately. I wish I could. I, I would if I didn't have like any knee problems or anything. I would probably ski that much just because I love it so, so much. But Yeah, these, day, these days I just have to be... What do you think? Uh, what was your uh, number this season, would you say? 150, 200? Yeah, something like that. I don't know exactly. That's still an insane season. Yeah, 
it was it was really good. But I was like a little bit better like uh, taking care of it because I learned like got this like schedule or structure during the summer where I was more like training hard for three days then one day off then two days more and then one day off so I would try to like split it up so I ski hard for like three or four days and then take a day off and then ski another two three and another day off instead of like because normally I just go 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 and usually if it's nice weather I'm not gonna stop ever really yeah you're the type of guy who doesn't take a day off yeah it was in the plans to like, even if it's super nice, I feel good. Like it's good for me to like, yeah, take a day off. And what's your vibe when you take a day off? Is it like, um, uh, playing video games, watching some stuff? Just what's your vibe when you take some day offs now? I usually bike quite a bit still. Uh, and yeah, try to take care of emails and like stuff that I, I'm pretty bad at taking care of, so like usually try to do that on my days off. Sounds uh, good. Yeah, but it was cool too. Like what I was saying, like with taking the cut in the season early last year, going into this season, I didn't start ski until like middle beginning of October. So it was basically like six months off without necessarily rehabbing an injury. Mm -hmm. And that was like super wicked, a feeling that I hadn't had in a while since I was like a little kid where you like during the summer start getting like the real itch where you're like, I cannot wait to go ski. And then yeah. you're like, fuck, it's like three more months. Okay. Like when you're young, going to school and you're just like praying that the snow will start falling early. Yeah. And you're just hitting your uh, backyard setup. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you you used to be uh, to have one, right? I remember you were posting edits of your backyard setup in Sweden. Yeah, yeah, I had a super nice backyard setup together. We with some friends, we bought a rail together, and yeah, luckily my parents allowed me to transform the whole backyard into a ski yard and yeah, to trash it up. Yeah, we definitely <laughs> trashed it a lot. <laughs> There was no more grass, and it was all mud and crazy, but. Yeah, yeah, they were very supportive, so I give thanks for that. So you mentioned that your um your season was really planned out. Where did that come from? Was it related to the Olympics? Um, is it something you usually do, planning it out uh, in detail beforehand? At times, but I think I do it more and more because I see the effect of it, like the positive outcome of it. That like when it is a little bit more clear in my head, so I don't have to like fully improvise and like go as it comes, kinda. And yeah, it was definitely like a little extra push and motivation for Olympics mm -hmm. to be like feeling fresh and feeling nice at it. And like mainly the the thing that I talked about with the Swedish coach, Niklas Eriksson, who is a super good skier as well, and We have a great relationship, being good friends and skied together a bunch when we were young. But we just came up with that if I compete a little bit less, it makes me a little bit extra motivated when I'm at the competition to like show what I can do instead of just going every every weekend and like kind of yeah, everything gets repetitive. Mm -hmm. I like it when it's fresh and you feel like you're looking forward to go to an event. So I skipped like the first big air event that was in Switzerland and then skipped two more events that was in January. And yeah, you just like try to like make sure that I wasn't like being not burnt out, but like tired of the competitions before Olympics. So when I got to Olympics, I was like, I haven't showed what I got yet this year. And now it's time for a first sponsor break. Adrenaline Urbaine recently opened their new action sports center in Trois-Rivières, Quebec. The center is unique as it offers a variety of action sports on the inside. It has an indoor skate park, rock climbing, and a ninja warrior style section. The cherry on top, it has a snow park on the rooftop that is open year round. Adrenaline Urbaine is perfect for both beginner or experienced riders. You can go and ride on your own or get private coaching for the sport of your choice. 
Its location in Trois-Rivières is perfect, as it's only an hour away from both Montreal and Quebec City. It's also around two hours from the American border. Adrenaline Urbaine opened the dream center for every action sports enthusiast, and it's so dope to have it here in Quebec. Check them out online at adrenalineurbaine.ca or in person at their center in Trois-Rivières, District 55. Support companies who support skiing. Support Adrenaline Urbaine. Right. I have two two things to ask you about that. Um, for the comps, is it something where you're kind kind of over it because you're 30, you've been in big time comps for, let's say, 12 years, approximately. Um, is there a point where you're because you you make me think of the the I'm a big tennis fan, like the tennis legends these days that are still there, like Nadal, Federer, Djokovic, where they're still competing, but they they do less and when they're there, they're there to win it all, but they're not about to do 30 tournaments a year. Right. Yeah, it's definitely like like that for sure. And that's with age and everything to like prioritize. So it's like quality over quantity, I guess. But in general, I'm like not really over. I, I love competing. I'm a pretty competitive person and I love the way it like pushes me and like brings out the best of me and my skiing. But coming this next year or maybe even next two years, I'm definitely gonna compete a lot less. I plan to pretty much only do X games this coming season if I get invited, which I hope. But yeah, I I just wanna like give a full focus and priority towards filming which I haven't really had the chance to do yet in my career. Mm -hmm. Like I've balanced the both of them a lot. And then some seasons definitely prioritize competitions over filming, but I never had the season yet where I'm like, let's make the coolest film segment I possibly can. Also when I just have the freedom of like skiing a lot and try to progress and try to get, really good at skiing because when you do compete a lot and go from contest to contest there is so limited of time for that where you like i feel like you progress a lot in the pre-season and then during the season mainly the comp season is you just doing what you're good at already and try to recover as well as you can in between competitions so you can bring out the best of what you already know how to do And then towards the end of the season is, again, where you learn a lot of new tricks. Right. But I want to have the chance to like feel like I don't have to be in perfect condition next week. I want to be more just in the moment when I ski, because that's when I ski the best and when I progress the most. Because there's kind of two types of people. I feel like some that like will go on a spring session on a big booter and then learn some tricks there. And then there's some other ones that it seems like to be in the moment like uh, big air finals at X Games and you do a trick that you had in mind for two years. Like in my mind, it seemed that's a, another category, but one clear example for that I have in mind for you is your nose butt triple. Yeah. It was like Tanner pushing you and it's like, okay, fuck it. I guess I'll try it. Yeah. Uh, so you're more the type of person that'll like t prepare it in the summer, spring or fall and like maybe do it in advance or practice it in advance. It all depends. Like for sure, X Games is a exception, or in the way, like for sure, like that. That's like the biggest show of the season usually for me, where I'm like, that's when I want to bring out my yeah. What or I've been maybe, thinking about is it that um, is it that big air and slope style are different in that sense? Like maybe big air, you'll try a, a variation that in slope style you can't really try in a run. Yeah, I I think so for sure. Like slope style. It's more about repetition and like have your stuff really dialed because you want to make slope style. I always think like top to bottom without mistakes. And if you can keep it clean, that's like the illest where you can showcase your flow and style. And Big Air is, is just, yeah, <laughs> all in. Put all your cards on the table, kind of, where you like. So then, then definitely like, it's easier too when you only have to focus on one jump. So it's easier to like try something that you maybe haven't tried before. But it's also what's cool about it too, because it's like 
the easier discipline, I think, but that makes it harder because it is easier. So it's easier for everybody to like learn new crazy variations. So it's like almost like, I guess like, like hundred meter sprint or whatever, you know, like every, a lot of people know how to run and p are able to run hundred meters, but it's like the top, top dogs that's able to do it and like win a medal and then maybe a marathon it's a little bit different that's like more challenging but maybe it's not as like well i think it's more a it's more a testament to you cuz both are super different but take some special skills like i don't think uh, usain bolt would like win a marathon no but, exactly but you have the skills for both like you yeah. can go out and do that special trick in big air but also do a crazy slope style run and there's some people that only did one in their career like There's some people that had great careers, but only had results in big air. Yeah. Like they weren't necessarily slow style guys. For sure. And that's cool too. I think it's cool that like there is people that can specify in certain disciplines and certain areas of skiing and others that is like more open to use like all of it. Yeah. So someone that I think when I think of big air specialist was a uh, Vinny, Vinny Gagne. Yeah. Elias Embul was really Elias, a big air yeah. guy. And even like as far as competitions, I feel like Kai Mahler yeah. was definitely better in big airs than slope styles. You mentioned um, uh, managing your schedule to be really hungry for uh, the Olympics. Was there a thinking in your head that I know you're really competitive? Was there a thinking that this time I'm going to get my fucking medal? <laughs> for sure. <laughs> no, for sure. For sure. That was like the plan. And I was like, Let's do it. And like, I wanted to put like my full, give it a, a real chance and real shot at doing so. So that's why it was like extra preparation and making sure that like I was doing it right. And I also had like the two previous Olympics that didn't necessarily go too well, mm -hmm. to like learn a lot from and like, no, I know what I did different the first time to the second time and like what I can do to like perform my third time. And like what I do during X games that makes me bring out the best of myself. And was like during the summer watching so, so many big air and slope style events and skateboard events and like just like studying and like was like, yeah, just looking at everything. So basically in 2022, it was the, um, it was the first time there was big air and slope style at the Olympics. Yep. Before that, Sochi was the first time there was slope style only. And then in Pyeongchang, there was only slope style, but snowboard got big air. Yeah. And skiing didn't. Were you disappointed um, at the, that last Olympics that there wasn't big air for skiing? Maybe not disappointed, but I think it would have been awesome if big air was in it as well, since the arena was already there. And yeah, I was feeling pretty good in big air as well at the time so it would have been awesome to have another shot because it's crazy too like yeah with olympics it's like so high prestige and only to get the chance every four year and if it was only in one event yeah and a slope style where it's like so many obstacles that can go a little bit wrong mm -hmm. and yeah but i i was still like appreciate it for the opportunity to go to a second olympics overall so yeah i wasn't i was definitely not like disappointed or mad or anything like that but it would have been awesome and now it's time for another sponsor break if you listen to this podcast you know axis board shop is the dopest shop in skiing they support athletes movies events and a bunch of other stuff related to skiing and snowboarding I've been to their shop recently and they're ready for ski season. They've received all the new skis, boots, outerwear, and every other thing you'll need for this season. So if you're in Quebec, go check out Axis Boutique in Saint Sauveur, or you can check them out online at accessboutique.ca. Support companies that support skiing, support Axis Board Shop. Well, I'll say I was mad because it felt like maybe skiing was behind snowboarding like 20 years ago. But at that point in 2018, I was like, well, what's the, what's the matter? Yeah. yeah, I hear you. <laughs> That's just the way it is. So it's like, yeah, yeah, nothing I can affect. You went to Sochi. I don't remember well Pyeongchang, but I remember Sochi. You had a really dope run that, in my mind, 
if you kind of landed it perfectly, you would have been on the podium, no doubt. But there might have been a bubble on your last hit. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> and you ended up sixth, which is really not bad, but still it's a it's a bummer knowing that that bubble was the difference, kind of. Yeah. And for then, sure. And how did Pyeongchang go? Pyeongchang was like more heavy for me. Kinda because I I was like skiing so good at the time. I thought I had won do tour that year. I had won X Games both slope style and big air the week before going to Olympics. And then was like feeling really good and and maybe the course it was like some a lot of things to it. Like the first two practice days, it was super slushy and nice. So then it was like running super well. And I basically took off all the e the edges on my skis because I was like riding in slush. And then I was like nice and all the rails were sliding perfect. Okay. And then last practice day and competition day, it like froze and got so icy that I had to like change my line a little bit because I couldn't land backwards in the hip because I would slip out every time. So you didn't have any skis with edges left? <laughs> I had like... Two or three pair, and they, I like for some, uh, it was like Damn. stupid. I like just took down the edges, and I we had a technician there. Yeah, and I was like telling him, could we try to get some more edges back? And then he tried, but yeah, that looks like um, some cross country skiing strategy. <laughs> where, you know, there's a lot going on with the the, the wax and everything. Yeah. Anyways, no, I, I think that that's that's definitely like an excuse as well. Like I I should have been able to do good, and then. But yeah, didn't even qualify. I mm. like first run fell on the first jump, just knuckled and like bite my tongue and was like bleeding like crazy in my mouth. So maybe that was like a lot of things going on in my head. And then yeah, second run, I kind of landed it, but it was just like not good from mm. top to bottom. And then it was like a shit show from the Swedish media and all that like that I am not taking Olympics seriously because I had done so well in all the events before. And like, Damn. yeah, he's just like here. And I was like still happy. Like at the end end of the day, I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm good. I'm, I didn't get injured. Unfortunately, unfortunately mm -hmm. it didn't work out the way I wanted to. And they were like, oh, he's way too happy. He should be crying. He should be more like, and I was like. Well, they should, they should know that you're the type of guy that's always smiling. Like at that point, it's not as if you're going to throw a tantrum or something. Yeah, no, exactly. But that was just like heavy. And I was like, come on. Like, yeah, <laughs> it was like not, not super nice. So then it was like definitely like some thoughts, like, do I want to go for another Olympics and mm -hmm. like have this possibly happen again? Or so that was like a bit like of a commitment last spring, I would say when I like decided to take like the extra focus and extra yeah crazy route going into olympics that like all right this could anything can happen at olympics olympics is like a completely different beast i feel like where it's like mm -hmm. it, it can be heavy like if you have a lot of expectations and people that believe in you i guess the and yeah i got to even witness it last year with like nija houston in skateboarding that's like always always in the final and like always like pretty much winning or second and he i saw him like in the qualification already when he dropped in he was like looking like i never seen him on a skateboard before where it was like mm. yeah but he made finals but then didn't make it at all in in the finals didn't do well and same with a swedish skateboarder in park oscar rosenberg who was like one of my favorite skaters and yeah he He didn't look like he normally do. So it was a lot of thoughts going into it and like, all right, this could be like scary to put this much effort and time and energy into an event that could just not go at all the way I see it. But then also I was like, for sure, like, yeah, this is my shot. Like I, w I was believing in it that like, it's better to do all these preparations rather than not do the preparations and come there and be like, not prepared. <laughs> mm -hmm. What do you think makes the difference in terms of pressure between X Games and the Olympics? 
because it seems like um <clears throat> from what i'm hearing it seems like you find it kind of heavy the olympics the the whole thing surrounding it whereas it seems like you're thriving off x games and it's something you're looking forward to like one is every year and the other is every four year but what do you think makes the difference in like um how people are handling it maybe yeah for me on my from personal perspective it's just that like all the sudden all the tv all the media is there and they like leading up to the event like are super following it and like wants to know everything about you and like all your your whole life and like all and like writing about everything so everything is like on tape mm -hmm. and like x games is like more individual you go there it doesn't matter what country necessarily you're from you're like representing free skiing and olympics you're like in you're over there like representing the country so the people that not doesn't follow skiing at all are all of a sudden like super sharing for you and but it's all good good pressure at the same time like i always try to turn it into a positive where i'm like i guess it's like people supporting and it's like awesome to feel the support from your country but it also makes you want to like be able to like give back or like represent it the right way as well so that like you put or i put a little extra pressure on myself and like and like what you say like it's it is only every four years so uh, you don't know how many chances you're gonna get to mm -hmm. possibly get on the podium in free skiing we know henrik we've known henrik for a while like there's no surprise we know what we're getting into what's the what's the vibe with the the mainstream public in Sweden, like, because you have had some some really big moments in the Olympics, like uh, you uh, shouting out the Wu Tang Clan at the bottom, and when you fell down with your there's the infamous photo with your pants down landing. Yeah. <laughs> um, what, what's your what's the Henrik situation in Sweden? Are you like a big star over there? Yeah, I think I have like grown into it a lot more and. Yeah, I think at first people were like, who is this crazy person? <laughs> But then I felt like always the older generations have always liked that I'm like so positive and like happy. And like, and these days, yeah, I, I think people have gone over the pa the point where it's like, he's like just this like crazy clown kind of more because they see like how much time I put into it and like, have now seen that I went to three Olympics. So obviously it's like, yeah, taking it seriously. <laughs> it's, it's not luck. No, exactly. And and even like last year or two years ago in, or in 21, there's like this big sports award in Sweden where like all the athletes from the year get like awards for like best male performance, best all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I was in this like one category that's like the most prestige because it's like the people's choice so everybody's like calling in to for who they want to win it mm -hmm. and i ended up getting third in that one which is like super crazy because it's like all the best hockey players soccer players and yes yeah, summer activities and it was a year when a lot of people had done really well but yeah people get like knocked out like kind of head to head And I was able to like stay in it for, yeah, until third place or whatever. So that was like a big eye opener for me. I was like, holy, okay, I guess people. The people know you, like you're in the, the mainstream. Uh, yeah. Obviously. Yeah. Then, people are aware of Enric. Yeah, I guess that's, so. <laughs> that's crazy. So what would you say are the biggest sports in Sweden? Like would, where would you say skiing ranks in terms of like the, the mainstream? Uh, free, skiing, love or... free skiing may be around like pretty far down it's definitely like hockey yeah. and cross country skiing are two super big soccer is also very very big and alpine skiing is big as well like racing yeah exactly and yeah i feel yeah a lot of sports people are in sweden are very into sport and very supportive of it but mm. yeah free skiing is not very hot topic unless it's Olympics, I think. Yeah, I feel you. And now it's time for another sponsor break. Planks Clothing is a super dope brand that I'm proud to have as a sponsor. 
Planks Clothing has been making rad ski gear for rad humans since 2009. If you need some new outerwear for this coming season, go check them out at planksclothing.com. Their products are super stylish, top quality, and are at an affordable price. Last season, I was filming and skiing with the men's good time insulated jacket, and I was super good all year round in the winter of Quebec. Support companies that support skiing, support Planks Clothing. Like in Quebec, uh, skiing is down low also. Like there's all the major team sports that are way bigger. Mm -hmm. But it's as if when there's one personality that the, mer the, that the media loves, then it gets big. So here, uh, the media loves Mick Kingsbury, the yeah, mogul skier. For sure. So he's like, the media doesn't care about skiing at all. But when it's about him, he's like, he's on every TV show and like he, he's a star here. Yeah. But he told me he had the same thing where he's used to winning every comp in moguls. Like I think he has now close to a hundred victories or something like that. It's, yeah. it's insane. And for him, it's as if, if he gets second, it's a fail for the media. Yeah. So it's like big time pressure of ma going into the Olympics and like managing himself and his expectations. Whereas getting second is super good. Yeah. But it'll be told through the media as if it was kind of a, a failure. Almost. Yeah. No, for sure. That, that must be so crazy. Cause I kind of saw it like this year at Olympics when he did get second mm -hmm. and like the Swedish guy won. And it was like the first time he beat Kingsbury, I think. And it was like a big thing, like for him, like for sure, like already any podium would have been like the greatest victory ever, greatest mm -hmm. success. But then for Kingsbury, it was like either win or it's a failure kind of. And you're like, holy, that must be like so crazy. Yeah. But I guess it is because he has been so, so dominant for so long that like, yeah. But I definitely feel for him like when it's, it must be crazy. <laughs> have you met him? Yeah, I have. A few times. He's so, so nice. Yeah. And he's a, he's so sick because he's also a, really into free skiing. Like yeah. I, grew, I grew up riding the same park as him. And like he would... um come back from let's say a mogul training with like his mogul kit on and come in the park and throw a cork 10 like he was a real free skiing guy wicked yeah i've seen when he's doing the dub 10s as well or like yeah. high mute bobby brown type flavor yeah really Sick. bobby style yeah i did an episode with mick two years ago and he explained i wasn't aware of the details of mogul skiing but basically it's not like a free skiing where you have the best of three runs. So you have three chances to get your best run. It's basically elimination every round. Yeah. Like you have kind of a quarterfinals where it's one, one run and then semifinal one run. And then the final you have one run. Yeah. So it's, uh, yeah. I've seen that. That is so crazy. Cause then it's like, yeah, you can't do any mistakes during the whole night. And it's like, yeah, going through so many rounds and you're like, holy. And yeah so many moguls in one run you know like you have to be so precise all the way down and like not let too much of the break but still it's on mm -hmm. speed as well so like yeah yeah speed and your your jumps yeah you know in uh both slope style and big air in the past years there's kind of been uh changes in format that have been tried you know some a couple of years ago at x games in big air you had to do a left side trick and a right side trick yeah, there's been a trying a jam format in the slope style. Do you think it could be cool to have that format in a, either big air or slope style, like having one trick and you just have to eliminate people? For sure, I think that it would probably work. Maybe it would work in slope style as well, but definitely big air. I think it would work fine, mm -hmm. and it'd be super nice if you weren't allowed to repeat the tricks as well. I think so you could see a little bit more variety and like even seeing like people playing chess in a way, like maybe not bringing out your very best trick for quarterfinals, mm -hmm. but like a trick that you safe or like feel comfortable with that you're going to make it into semifinals or whatever. And then maybe you save like the super trick for the final and maybe other people is like doing it the other way. So making sure, that they make it into final. Yeah, I think it... Maybe like a, almost kind of like in the slush games. Yeah. Where you're kind of being strategic with your opponent. Totally. 
yeah, maybe we can we can just branch off into that a bit. You weren't at X Games this year. No. What was that about? Were the people missed you? It's not it's not X Games if Henrik is not there. <laughs> yeah, for sure it is. But thank you for yeah. that. That's a nice compliment. But no, actually, it was kind. Of, it was crazy. I I actually got COVID right no. there, right before. So I was in France with the Swedish team for a Fontromeo World Cup. And yeah, it was crazy. I got COVID. Jesper got COVID. Hugo got COVID. The coach Niklas got COVID. And our other filmer, Kuske, as well. And none of us had had COVID during the whole like two year pre- period. Mm. And then all everybody got it right then. And it was like so tight until Olympics as well, which was kind of crazy. Like first off, like it was for sure we can't go to X Games. And I think three or four of us were going over there. Like Hugo was going for Knucklehuck and Jasper and Oliver and me. But then it was super crazy with with that going to Olympics too. Because I guess like three days before you had to have negative results. And yeah, we we all got negative the last day you were allowed to be negative. Otherwise, we would have been, we had to push down, or we had to, we pushed the trip, departure day one day later to have a little bit more room, a little bit more space. But otherwise, if we wouldn't have been able on that day, we would have probably missed the practice for Big Air. And it was like pretty crazy. For the Olympics, you mean? Yeah. Damn. Yeah. And yeah, exactly. And like after all the preparation, all the extra time and being like so careful and staying away from people and everything. And then like all of a sudden, and in my case too, I was like not sick even. I like felt a little bit in my throat one day and then I was like, fuck, because I usually never really get sick. So I was like, it's probably now, huh? It's, it's right here. And then, yeah, you're staying at home for like, a week straight and like feeling good and like, come on, come on, going to the sauna three days, uh, three <laughs> times a day and like trying to sweat it out and like, come on, just give me a negative result so I can like eat and get prepared for this event. And also, but it was pretty fun and cool at the same time to like watch X Games from home because I haven't done that in 13 years in a row now. That's so, crazy. It was it was a really fun experience. Obviously, I would have loved, prefer to be there skiing as well. But it was I enjoyed sitting at home and like I had my notes and stuff and was like kind of like trying to write down and like see what people was doing and yeah, learn something from just watching it. Were you playing the the judging game? Yeah, yeah, we did actually. We had like a a conversation a group conversation the whole swedish team and we were all like after every run like putting down what we thought like yeah the score was gonna be and like comments and stuff about it and yeah well, it was it was a fun experience for sure to watch x games at home but i missed it and i hope i never have to sit out from it again <laughs> yeah there was a lot of covid um, um covid how would you say covid cancellations yeah okay cat there was like a big uh, merry-go-round for knucklehuck where the first invitees had to cancel and then they had, they had the second round and they also canceled so it seemed like a a big uh struggle for the the organizers yeah and it was kind of crazy too with uh like i hadn't seen phil for almost like two years Because last time we had chilled together was in Zermatt. We were skiing. And then he went back to Quebec and was going to do the third real ski. And then he tore his ACL. And then after COVID came in and we were maybe going to see each other at high five festivals. And then, yeah, a lot of re- a lot of things happened. So then we were like, finally, like, all right, at X Games, let's link up and let's ski together. And like, I, I was like looking so much forward to hanging out with Phil. And then it was horrible. Like I caught COVID and I sent him a message. I was like, fuck, bro, I'm 
sorry, I will, I'm not going to be there. Yeah. And then he was like, bro, I just went to the airport and I tested positive at the airport. So I'm not going either. So I guess it was for a reason. Damn. Yeah, I think he was hyped also. First X Games in a while. Yeah. He, uh, he went to maximize the, the training spot in Quebec and like practice the only on the knuckle there. Yeah. I was yeah. bummed for him. I was looking so much so forward to seeing him ski there and yeah. get to ski with him for Knucklehuck. I was like, that's like gonna be the, the that shit. would have been crazy. The B and E and Knucklehuck shredding together. They need to invite you both this year. Yeah, that would be awesome. <laughs> so we we mentioned a bit that you you judged on your end. Were, <laughs> yeah. Did you agree with the judging? Agreed with it. Yeah, I think so. Uh, I can't remember exactly, but I, I remember like I don't agree with like the way the the computer fucked up with a score of Matei, let's say, where he had like two 48s and one was a no spot trip 19, one was a no spot dub 19. I have the answer for that. And I guess they put in the scores and the, the computer thought it was the no. same trick or something? No? I, I, I just did an episode with Jason Ahrens, who's a, a judge. Yeah. And we talked about that. Let's hear it. And, and he <laughs> said, he basically said, I'm, I'm going to try to remember well, but that... There, it, it had to be two distinctively different trick, like the rule. Okay. Um, your two different scores had to be different tricks. Like it couldn't be two dub, dub 19s. It, it would have been one score. And their thinking was that one, one trick was a nose bud dub 19 and the other was a nose bud triple 19, something like that. Yeah. And he was like, it was too similar of a trick to be considered two different tricks. Wow. In a sense I think that, that's, that that's not. Yeah, yeah. Well, in my mind, I said also in my mind that's two different tricks. But he went. He talked a, a bit about in snowboarding, uh, it would be considered the same trick. They have kind of a different view of way of seeing it, where in in their mind, the number of spins is more important. Like it doesn't matter how many time you cork it; it's the same trick. I'm I'm not that much aware of the snowboarding side, but yeah, and. What he said I wish was it more like that in skiing too. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. <laughs> well, and he said that Matej tried the switch quad and didn't land it well. And in his mind, he was like, "Well, anyway, we th we thought he was gonna go back for another switch quad and do it better, but he didn't end up doing it again." But anyways, the the whole point was that in their mind, it was too similar of a trick, which I guess I guess is fine. It's their it's their way of seeing it, but it made me think like. It's so hard to, it's so hard to get the difference when you get those types of rules. Like let's say the rule of yeah. having two different tricks, and then it's like, well, what makes a trick different? Is it a grab? Is it the spin? Like, it made me think like, should it be only your best trick, like one trick? So yeah. then you don't you don't have that problem. Then it would work exactly what we were talking before with the elimination rounds. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I I thought that was that that's kind of unfair to hear that they thought it was too similar just because mate the double was almost like straight up and it was with japan mm -hmm. it was almost like not even a dub like just a nose butt 19 court. yeah and it was with japan and the triple was with safety mm -hmm. and like in that case then i for me it's almost like more similar even let's say like a hall's trick was like switch dub 18 with the Buick and switch yeah. dub 21 with the Buick. Yeah. Like where it's like more, for me, more similar, just that it's another 360 in the middle. Mm -hmm. But then is his point was one is switch, one is not switch. So that's like the big differentiating factor. But I think it wasn't AWOLS too. The, both the good one was the switch, like switch 18 I and think switch one, 21. I think one was a, one was from the front. One yeah, was switch, switch 21 and the other one was straight, but I don't remember exactly. Anyway, I'm I'm not saying uh, I think A-Hall deserved it. And for yeah. me, it's still two different tricks. Mm -hmm. But for me, those were more similar mm -hmm. than Matej's, maybe. Yeah. But, but it, it's anyway. so... <laughs> when, when you get in, I feel like it's so hard when you... Every rule you create can 
create some confusion or you know with every rule you create you can create some problems like with so jason much. we got into the <laughs> poll the polls or no polls debate or and yeah it opens up like is there a limitation for ski length or yeah. that you know that they have in racing let's say right and yeah there's a what's your opinion on the polls no polls because you're a guy who competed with and without yeah yeah i i guess there's a long long Explan explanation but i think like let's say first uh for in competitions because i guess in uh, other than competitions you don't care maybe yeah no i think exactly it's like up to each own do exactly what you want to do i'm gonna ski outside of competition with and without and probably in competition as well but i think if you if you can do a trick with poles is usually should be higher reward than doing the same exact trick without poles mm. so then because it is harder with certain grabs like certain grabs is like so hard with poles rather than without poles like when mm -hmm. you go like all crazy like that's like why Vinny cash like his super grabs with big poles is like even more impressive than if somebody would do it without poles then i think it's deserving that the one with poles should get a higher score for it in a competition mm -hmm. but then again like for like outside of competition like fully like just whatever looks the best feels the best and express the trick the best way i think mm -hmm. but in competition when it is when you have to have a bit of a structure and like a formula somewhat if some if it's two the same tricks one with poles one without the one with in my opinion wins Yeah, and he explained me the whole system of how it works and the criteria and how they, they judge it. And I was really impressed by how thought out it is. Like they, they really thought about everything. But anyways, it's a it's an insane job that they have to do. For sure. Um, <laughs> and we were talking about the polls, no polls. We went a bit into like the history of it all. Like, do you remember Wallish got scored zeros at the US Open? At Aspen Open. Aspen Open. Yeah. yeah. I do remember that for sure. I didn't remember it was zeros. Yeah, I think he even said on the score, no pulse or something like that. Shit. Yeah, that was crazy. Did you ever have a situation like that when you were judged harshly for whatever reason? No. Maybe not. Or maybe actually, I remember when I was like 14 years old, I went to this big air event in Zurich called freestyle.ch. And I remember I was there hanging out a lot with Mikkel and Mikkel Deshno. And we both had like the grills, both had like a, yeah, like more hip hop influenced style of skiing. And I remember I didn't, I did like some pretty good tricks and didn't get good score at all and then i remember hearing the judges was saying like too much that i had like too much of an influence like trying to look like mikhail mm. kind of and that i think that's the only occasion where something like that happened where it was something outside of my performance that played yeah. in you didn't take it too personally no <laughs> i was like <laughs> okay i guess whatever that's what they think yeah is... at 14 it's uh good to brush it off yeah we talked a bit about the big air at x games that you weren't in do you, what were your your highlights because in my mind well i guess we can say that almost every year but this year the level was super good yeah like um the It's podium was a all mac forehand and teal harley yeah then after that there was ed joy edward terrio that was super good yeah matej came in fifth and then colby andre and heaven mckechran yeah heaven took a, a beating i don't know if you remember yeah, yeah. two, two in a row. yeah that were heavy ones damn heavy ones yeah i i was like so impressed with mac forehand the way he skied both in big air and slope style i thought he was like so solid looking and his tricks were i liked his trick choices and yeah the expression of his tricks And I, I think he got a little underscored, if I remember right, in slope style. I thought he had, like, 
yeah, should have gone a little bit better score. But yeah, like you say, everybody skied so so well. Yeah, I you know, think my favorite was Teal. Teal is Teal jumps. for sure. Teal was incredible. Like the way he, yeah, the switch trip. 18 with mute was like the first try he ever did i remember him coming down and it's like that was like that was first try and it was like no way and then the trip 19 safety with like super parallel safety on a high spin like that is yeah teal was so good the like switch triple 14 bring back kind of style switch sev to switch dub sev yeah i think you, you had a lot of influence in those type of tricks right those tricks where you kind of stop the rotation maybe huh <laughs> i, I think yeah, that, that would be yeah wasn't there a, so i appreciate it i kind of the switch cork threes yeah i i think i did a bunch of it so hopefully inspired people to maybe look a little bit outside the box and there isn't always about or maybe not the switch cork screen. threes but also like the cork ones kind of the yeah the reverts like more or like flat one kind of yeah flat one exactly but definitely like with together with phil we did a bunch of like the switch threes pretty early like in education of style and movies like that yeah so i think we definitely was part of it but i can't say exactly if that's where they got the inspiration from but i Mm. appreciate it (laughs) but it's something that a couple skiers helped build like uh I know A Hall did some recently of like reverting in the spins and Vinny Gagne also. For sure. Yeah. Charles Gagne too. Yeah. You're someone I think who has big opinions on skiing since you're so passionate and so so involved. I remember when they tried at X Games changing the format and you had to do a left side trick and a right side trick, maybe around 2016, around those years, 2015 maybe. 18. Okay. I thought it was earlier than that. But no, I yeah, I, I was 2018. Cause I won with it, but I hated it. <laughs> mm, yeah, with your switch right triple. Exactly. But that that was dope. Switch right triple with kind of lead mute. Yeah, like um, the the Wallish mute or Tony. Yeah. Kanye mute. Yeah. I remember the the interviewer was at the bottom asking you the classic question and like expecting you to say, "Oh, I'm so stoked. Uh, it's a bit. It's a thing." <laughs> and we could see that. You you had to say it, but you didn't really want to. I don't know. You were you seemed conflicted, and you said, "Yeah." You just like ignored her question and said, "Like, yeah, I think we should go back to the old format. It's better." Yeah, <laughs> I thought that was so so great. No, I uh, I definitely yeah I uh, I I thought so too. Like it it like limited so much. The riders that maybe like what we talked about before that specify in big air mm-hmm. that like maybe like a Vinny Gagne that has like so much creative tricks that are like so unique, but maybe only spins his natural way. And it like made it more into like a slope style event where it was like not best trick. It was like more about showing that you can spin both ways. Yeah. And it's well, in some ways like it favors other people too that like maybe do spin like like for example uh, a Jesper Shader that like his natural way of spinning switch is left and forward right. Really? So for him it's like I didn't both, know both that. is natural, but so he's like it favors a skier like that. It favors slope style specialized skiers. Definitely. Yeah. And I, I thought like people were, but it, it also like motivated me too. Cause I remember we got the like email pretty early, like in maybe in the summer or something that it was going to be changed format for one right side and one left side trick. So then I already like started brainstorming and I was like thinking like people is going to like count me out now because they maybe don't see my right side being like my strong, stronger type of trick. So then I, but then I definitely like thought of it and like started like practicing in my head and stuff to like yeah I'm gonna have the back to back switch triples so like come through okay. when it when it counts. Yeah, and also I thought it didn't fit the the history and the culture of Big Air, mm-hmm. where let's say at that point Big Air existed for maybe twenty years. Yeah, and it never was about spinning both ways. So I kind of saw 
what they were trying to do, but at the same time, it, it didn't feel right with what Big Air was. Yeah, I agree. I, I thought that's exactly, and that's why I kind of felt like I had to say something. And during the whole time, too, I was always thinking about, like, I need to win so mm. I can bring this message because it's, like, so right. easy to say this message if you don't do well, like, complain or hate on something that doesn't favoring yourself. But then I was like, all right, I'm going to win. Or I, I need to win so I can, like, say what I think about this without – sounding like a crazy person that's like against something that's like working out yeah you're right it can be easily misinterpreted mm -hmm. so yeah, much that, that's dope <laughs> we talked a bit about uh, what big air could be what it tried to be when they changed do you have stuff that you because they're these days it seems like every year they're trying to maybe adapt the format do you have some ideas for big air that of changes or would you keep it the way it is Like, what's your thoughts on the, the Big Air evolution these days with the tricks still evolving in 2022? There was still new tricks being done this year. It's crazy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think there is a lot of different ways or different approaches you can go. And one is like what we talked about before, like having it more eliminating and maybe, maybe not necessarily head to head, Because mm -hmm. head-to-head in Big Air can sometimes be unfair where somebody who would get second place or one and two already meet in the first round and then one gets like kind of... It's always the right winner that ends up winning. Mm -hmm. But the elimination round is cooler because then like still the like top two dogs can like always proceed. Yeah. But I definitely thought about also that like having more round, runs count would be cool it was cool year of 2020 when it was every round counted because then it was like yeah it was more yeah that was really like a a jam format yeah jam format but every round count counts so then it was like about being perfect the whole way through and that was fun and challenging as well because then it was like five tricks that you had to land mm -hmm. and you won but, that year right yeah yeah But then uh, by playing the strategy, the good, I think. And, uh, but also like, yeah, if it was like four tricks out of five jumps that counted would be cool. It would also be very cool if it was maybe a style, style focused trick as well, which could be hard, but like you would maybe set it so you could only allow to spin up to a 540 or a 720 just to, for people to showcase that as well because there is so many technical ways of doing a 540 and like stylish way and like for the audience too like maybe not the mainstream i feel like that is like what ca catches more people's eyes sometimes because that's like what they can relate to and they can see like whoa a big mm -hmm. laid out five or like something just fresh to it as well and showcases too that like you can do both And everybody these days are definitely capable of it. Like people are so talented these days that they can definitely learn. And even more if it, if the format was set for that. So you had to, like people would focus a little bit more on like, maybe I'm going to learn like the fattest Switch 3 ever. Yeah. And like it would be so cool for the sport too, like that more of the focus goes into that side as well because it's it's definitely like almost or definitely as technical as spinning mm -hmm. super super much because the slower you have to set the more precise you have to be and the way of tweaking because if a three with a tweak you have to set so slow because the tweak is gonna add or like make you spin faster yeah um i think freestyle.ch had that is it possible back in the days they yeah. did You had to have one tech jump, they called it, and then one style jump. Yeah, they did it for, yeah, exactly, qualies and uh, semis. And then final was always one, two, two runs, best trick count. Yeah. But that one, that one was nice, but it was like still like a city big air, so it's a little bit smaller, not as much like opportunity for like really express, like with a nice carve and like 
feeling yeah. good on the jump. And also it was like always kind of a question because they never set like, because I remember one one year I did like a five blunt on the style trick that was like super nice. But then some people was like doing rodeo nines and mm-hmm. would like beat it because it was like a rodeo nine versus a quirk five. But for me, it was like, ah. So I it was still I, get going into the, well, this one is more tech. Exactly. So then the next event, I did a rodeo nine and then I ended up winning. <laughs> but it was like, so I just like learned and I played by the rules in a way. Yeah. But I think that's why it has to be set or like be more clear that the degree of spin shouldn't matter. It has to be like really like the execution of the trick that is mm-hmm. like the style. Yeah. And it's always about like defining in detail what the judges are expecting so everyone knows what they're what they're going into. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about the Olympics. Yes, sir. You mentioned a bit that uh, there was the COVID struggle. You almost missed the practice. And then first off, when you get there, it's big air. How did it go? Well, we know how it ended. Bronze medal. So congrats to you. But tell me how, how it was. First Olympic big air. It was amazing. The whole experience. I, I loved it. I had such a good time. From the first practice until the last of, last competition run, and yeah, we were so fortunate with the weather. First off, like it was pretty warm, and got almost slushy landing. The mm-hmm. whole structure is as good as it gets for a big air jump. The like amount of air time, the in run being wide and long, limit unlimited of speed. Transitions are nice, long outrun. There's like double elevator that goes fast, so you can lap fast. And at one big thing too is that like there's a big platform at the top. So like during the practice, everybody, all the riders can have their skis on and then one slides out and like mm. kind of like when you're skiing in the park, instead of like you putting on the skis and then have to go straight into the jump. And even like also it was snow on the side of the jump. So you could like, if wind or like you'd be slow or like doesn't have the right feeling, you could just go to the side and ride. And like, yeah, the everything was like super nice for it to be a good event. Yeah, you really saw the evolution in the last 15 years with the scaffolding jumps from like being super sketchy and this, you know, to now it's like the most perfect thing. Yeah. Fully. And yeah, everything was like going really well for me too. And I, yeah, was just feeling good and like kind of like started getting like a little bit more like kind of from learning too from my past experience at Olympics with like, like almost setting my bar a little too high because I was like, it's Olympics. I got to have like the most crazy new runs possible. But then like your chance of doing it perfect lowers Mm -hmm. so this time around i was like thinking like i'm gonna go and like do so like do tricks i have done before but do it the best i ever done it so rather focus on perfection rather than progression maybe Mm -hmm. but then i i like had like a lot of other tricks too like that had been thinking and practicing and was like thinking like to bring out as well but then I definitely wanted to like the first Olympic games. I wanted to kind of bring out my signature trick, which is like the no sputter triple. I wanted to bring that back and like, but do like a nice one. And yeah, but mainly just like focusing on being like perfect and feeling good with my tricks and like making them look good rather than just like going for something that like I am not like handling perfect yet. Mm Mm-hmm. So then like I took down maybe a little bit on the progression and like some people maybe would like go for like a bit more technical grabs or like stuff like that. But I just like went like fully with what I wanted to do, what I want to see myself doing and that I can do as perfect as possible. And that ended up being no spot trip 16 and switch the bio 18. And just tried to go big and like, yeah, stomp. But I had like one moment that was like the coolest moment ever going into my last run. Because my first run in the finals, I did no spot trip 16. 
and kind of touched my hand a little bit. So it wasn't perfect. Second jump did a super nice switch dub 18 safety and went big and got good score. So then going into my last jump, I was second last to drop because going into the last run, the whole thing, they reversed the start order and I was in second place already and Burke in first. Mm. But then uh, Colby surpassed and then my friend Oliver from Sweden surpassed right before me the last jump. So I was in fourth place Damn. right before dropping in. And I was like at the top. And this was like so, so special for me. Because normally in a situation like that, and even more probably like during Olympics, I would imagine you like almost want to escape that feeling. Like it's like too much pressure and you like, you don't, it's not very nice to like stand there and be like, fuck, this is like my chance. I'm, I don't have the medal right now. I want the medal so much. I worked so much for this. But in that moment, I remember standing at the top and like looking down and I was like, fuck, this is the sickest shit. It's like exactly where I want to be right now. Like I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. I wouldn't want to change myself or do anything. And I was like so comfortable. I was like, I'm just going to go do the nose butt trip 16 again, but do it perfect this time. So it's like, at least I've done all I could and like followed my plan with the two tricks and done them perfect. And I don't know, I was like so comf- confident and comfortable and happy mm-hmm. in that space. And then I landed it. And I was like, yeah, this gotta be, this gotta be a well, medal, hopefully. At that point, maybe you knew with the scores that, okay, I'm at that point with a trip 16 that wasn't perfect. So you knew in your head that if you get it perfect, it, you'll, you'll most likely be good. And then it's a trick that you know you can get down that you've did in the past. So you were just like, okay, let's go. Yeah. Exactly, exactly like that. Because that originally my plan was to do the two first trick, those trick, and do them perfect. And then I had like one special up in the sleeve. Can you tell us? No, but hopefully <laughs> I, I show you at X Games next year if I get invited. Sounds, <laughs> sound, sounds good. Yeah. No, but exactly what you said. Like I, like Oliver surpassed me with like one point. So I knew like, and I had done a mistake. So I knew like, if I do a cleanup for sure should get like two, three more points for it. Mm -hmm. So then I was like playing a bit chess, like where I was like, it's going to be so hard for me to like, I could have like maybe stepped it up and gone second, but so hard to step up even to get first. Mm -hmm. But then also the chance of getting fourth is a lot bigger. So I was like, I just want a medal. I want to like be able to, have gotten a medal at Olympics, like no matter what color, like for sure you always dream of like getting gold, of course, but bronze is also a super success for myself, especially since I hadn't gotten it the previous two. So then exactly just like playing chess the right way by just like, this is what I need. This is what I'm going to do. Don't, don't go like too far. Like just do what you have to do. And I did it, and I, I'm so so happy that that was like the way I decided to go. Fuck yeah! What do you think? I thought it was crazy that the trip nosebud trip 16 was still relevant in 2022. <laughs> not, not a diss on the trick, because the diss, no. the, the the trick is crazy, but it made me think like, holy shit, was he ahead of his time when he did it 10 years ago? Yeah, because it, it it took a while for people to to caught on. Like people have been doing it recently, but it's yeah. crazy to to think back in 2013 that you did it. For how sure. like, <laughs> insane it was! Yeah, definitely, and I, I feel that so so much too. And it was nice too because it was like a few years that it wouldn't really get the recognition I thought they deserved because it, it is like. A perfectly executed butter on that big of a jump is like you have to be so precise mm. and do it so well. And then at some point they were like, "Yeah, Henry can do it." So like, 
it, I didn't Maybe because it wasn't new anymore? Exactly. And then I didn't get hooked up for it. So then I was like, oh, I'd rather, I might as well just do without the butter. It's like, mm-hmm. it's so much easier. <laughs> so, so like, let's not be dumb. Let's not do the harder tricks that I don't get better points for doing. Yeah. And then it kind of came around like a lot of things do, like with full circle and all waves and everything. And I kind of had a chat with the judges last year where they're like, why don't you do the nose butter? And I was like, well, it doesn't get the, the, what it deserves. And yeah. they're like, okay. And then I saw like the first event that I skipped this year or this last season was the big air event in Switzerland where Matei won with a nose butter 18 double. And I was like, when I saw that, I was like, all right. <laughs> okay, now now that's the way they set the way they're gonna judge this season. Yeah, and that was again like super nice to not go to the event and like more like study the tricks that people do and the way the judges react to the tricks. And so I like like already then like was like, all right, the butter is coming back, but let's not show it too much before because I knew like my trick at Olympics got to be a butter. But let's not get the judges tired of seeing the butter. Right. So I only did one event, the big air event in uh, Steamboat. And I did the nose butter triple for the qualies and ended up winning the qualies. And then I broke my boot in the practice, two boots (laughs) actually, in the practice for the finals. I broke my boot and then got my coach and Nicholas boot. And I broke that boot too. So then I was like, ah, all right, I'm not going to do that. No spur triple in the finals. I didn't didn't really get a result, but then in a way I thought too, that's perfect. I got to show it. I won the qualies. I know I can do it. The judges respond was great. Mm-hmm. Let's wait until X Games or Olympics. Yeah. Side note, how do you break boots? How do you manage to break boots? I just that those two times I went big and just flexed. And I break like the top buckle. There's like a plastic piece. Yeah. And I like, yeah. So you over... just flex it too hard? Yeah, I guess Damn. so. And I ride my boots pretty soft. Okay. So maybe it's that too. I usually on full tilt, there is like full tilt or K2 now. Yeah. There's three buckles. So it's like the bottom buckle, the ankle buckle and top buckle. And bottom one, I almost, I never really even buckle. Because that one doesn't do Dude, so you guys much. are insane. The middle one, I, I go pretty tight. So my heel is like staying down down in it. And like my foot feels like secure to it. But the top buckle, I go loose on too. So I can like go so far forward. Like Dude, for the I, butter and presses. I I don't understand that. The same thing with Belmar. When I, I filmed with him, he like almost did it. He didn't clip his, his uh, the one near his toes. Didn't yeah. clip it. I was like, like I, I'm the type of guy who like tights it to the max. So when I see that, I'm like, how do you do it? Like, I don't yeah. understand it. I used to ride like super, super loose when I was younger and I loved it. But then when I had a little bit more knee problems, mm. it was definitely feeling better when I buckled it harder. Cause then it was like more in like one motion, everything. And it's not like double motion with the boot and leg moving around. But then going into this year, I think probably because of the big break and like taking a little bit more care, I felt so good. So then I, I was so happy to not having to buckle my boots so hard. Yeah. Because what they say is, uh, you know, as you said, if it's tight, then there's not a change. In, how do you say that? The skis follow more closely if it's tight. Mm-hmm. There, there's no in between. And you guys are doing so so much stuff that's crazy that i think you would want it to be tied but i guess whatever whatever feels more comfortable yeah yeah for me i think it's always been like more kind of to just have like a i don't know relaxed or like Mm -hmm. not sloppy but like just more loose feeling kind of because i remember like growing up too like skateboarders i would always see them like lose their shoes yeah sometimes if they like run off the board they lose the shoes and then i was like early like okay 
people the skates have like the skate shoes super loose and then same even with rollerblading i like saw like people that was like rollerblading they didn't even buckle at all and it was like the loosest so then i was like all right so you gotta be like feeling comfortable and like all loose so then i think i just started doing that one skiing too and was like all right like because everything is like all about like yeah as you know like with skiing and like the way you feel and the way you like dress and the way it makes yeah you feel basically and that was like part of it like feeling loose in the boots was like yeah this is my steez <laughs> <laughs> so you started off the olympics with a bang you got your objective cleared like getting a medal right on how was it for slope style after that because um I, you tell me after that but I remember watching it and it seemed odd to me how much people, the course didn't seem as intense as Sochi or Pyeongchang. It seemed more mellow, but a lot of people weren't landing their runs. Yeah. From what I was seeing. Yeah. I, I guess there was like a few layers to why maybe it didn't really work the way I wanted to for the slope style this year at Olympics. And like, first off was that After the Big Air event, we had to stay down in the... Because the Big Air event was down in Beijing. Mm -hmm. And the Slope Style event up in Secret Garden, I think it's called. And uh, it's like maybe four hours away from Beijing. Okay. But, but we had to stay down in the city of Beijing because it's like the medal ceremony down there. Which started at maybe nine at night and was finished around 10. And then we had to catch the bus around, yeah, like 11, 12, and then mm. four hours. And then the next morning at nine in the morning was the first practice of slope style. Yeah. And so, yeah, I remember I was like so sore. But that's and weird in, in terms of the organization when you think they have a whole two week. And horrible. That <laughs> the, the bigger athletes are the same that the slope style and then the ones who, who uh, perform the best are going to be anyways. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's odd. Yeah. I, I thought it was like so odd too. And there was the same thing that there was the same thing in Pyeongchang that, that I found odd was that the, pra not the practice, but the qualies and the finals were in the same day. Yeah. And to me, it felt odd because I, I watched them both in a row and I, you could see that people were tired from doing both in a row. For sure. And same was in Sochi too. Then both was all in one day. Mm. And then I remember I was like super hyped when I saw the schedule that finally we were going to have qualies, then one day off, and then finals. Yeah. But then I forgot about the part that was like <laughs> go straight into slope style. But so there was like a few things. I remember like my legs too, like not even my knee, but just my quads. Because on both my jumps that I landed, I went like pretty big. And I remember my, my legs were so, so sore. And it was like really, really cold and like pretty icy. So it was like a little bit harder to get into the slope style practice the first two days, especially. And there was also like the, the part of me feeling that I wanted to be kind of like sharing the what had just happened in big air too it's so easy for me to like sometimes just move on to the next thing right away like mm. and like not get to like live or like soak in soak it in exactly soak in the moment that like is so big and meaningful that like you're so fast to just move on next 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 and then like yeah. so then there was like a part of me that was like trying to like also like digest and enjoy like fuck it was like eight or like 10 years of trying to get an olympic medal and i got one now like at 30 years old and like it was like all like a lot of things i was like wow this is so sick and then the slope style course being not the easiest definitely not as hard as pyeongchang maybe but it was still like not the easiest to figure out i thought And then kind of figured it out right before the qualies. But then, yeah, just didn't 
perform it perfectly, unfortunately. Mm. And what was the issue for you? Was it on, on the rails or the jumps? First run, I missed the first rail. Mm. Like kind of did a 270 out and landed like a little bit on edge and all of a sudden was in the left lane. And I normally went for the right lane and then I just had to improvise. Right. And then I was like, ah. And then second run, I just went a little small on the second jump. Like a li- little bit of a too big speed check. So kind of like hip check a little bit in the landing. So I, it was, yeah. I think if I wouldn't have done so well in Big Air, I would have probably been like extra motivated for it. But I also like going into Olympics knew that like Big Air was where I was feeling the strongest. I hadn't like done so well in the previous slope style events and I knew if I have to, I can like bring out something. But then Big Air, I was like, that is the first Olympic Big Air event for skiing ever. That's like was my goal. I wanted to be on that podium and be part of that for the history and everything. Yeah. So th- there was like some layers by wish, definitely. Like if it would have been maybe one or two days in between Big Air and Slope Style, so I could digest the Big Air and be like, mm-hmm. all right, let's let's get it in Slope Style too. Then that that could have change the outcome but looking back at it too i'm like i don't regret anything obviously and i'm like so so happy and i'm very happy that i did take the time in the olympic village and did let it soak in the medal from big air and yeah i had some really good time over there still a lot of partying no (laughs) just enjoy enjoying the 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 village and the competitions yeah, and just the like feeling like of being like just being an Olympian walking around with all these like super top athletes that are like the better the best in the world at at their yeah their sport or their discipline and yeah I just felt like it was super nice feeling for me to also like have like achieved in a way like being able to like handle getting up on a podium in our Olympics and just, yeah. Cause at some point, like definitely many times I thought like, ah, maybe Olympics isn't like my thing, mm. but then I'm, I'm always like, so always being competitive and always being like, ah, I know I can do it. So yeah. I just, I just gotta do it. You just gotta not treat it really too different from my X games. And like, mm-hmm. yeah, just that as any other comp. Exactly. Yeah. Was there a thinking on your end before that of maybe not going? Yeah, I think like, but, but for a small amount of time, but definitely like after the Pyeongchang, when I was getting so much heat from all the media and everybody in Sweden, mm-hmm. they were like calling it the yeah big fiasco, big failure <laughs> and all that. I was, I was like, all right, well then you get somebody else from Sweden that's going to represent it better kind of thinking (laughs) or like, yeah, you know, you're just like, ah, I'm over this. I don't, I don't need Olympics necessarily. Like I'm so happy with what I'm able to accomplish as far as competitive skiing outside Olympics. So if they don't appreciate me going there and trying my best, then, then I don't want it. Yeah. But that was like for maybe like a few for, two, three months. And then after that, I was like, all right, let's put in the work. Let's, let's go. And instead of like letting the critics win, like I, I was like taking like flipping it kind of like, I'm going to show the credit critiques. or I don't know how you say it even, but critics, critics, exactly. Like show them that like, I am. Yeah. Yeah. And anyways, you're, you're doing it, doing it for yourself also, like not letting them influence you exactly exactly you you mentioned the coverage that there was for the olympics and the big fiasco as you said <laughs> how much coverage is there for the x games in sweden like so little <laughs> yeah okay because it's the same thing in canada like if max perot or someone wins a medal they'll mention it 10 seconds in in the media like yeah. it's it's minimal yeah it's the exact same thing in sweden too and they, yeah, exactly. They mention it maybe on the news and write in the newspaper 
and it's yeah. gotten better, I guess. Like since what happened for me at that like big sports award, mm-hmm. like getting yeah, the recognition, then like people started like, I right, like maybe people more people wants to hear more about free skiing. So it's like getting better and better, but definitely like on a whole different level than Olympics. Right. And but but it's always like and it's always like with X Games, all the media always, always have to like want me to compare how much does X game mean compared to Olympics? And I'm like, I don't compare them to each other. Like they're two different events. <laughs> I love to be a part of both, but it's like, yeah, I don't know why I would compare them to each other really. Okay. Well, I guess I won't ask that. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Um, what's the thinking for Cortina? Do you see yourself going? I think um, if I, if I want to do it, I think I'm capable of doing it. But I think exactly like what I was saying in the beginning that I'm going to take like one or two years where I'm definitely going to compete a lot less. Yeah. But not in any way turn down the notch of trick level or I want to like get, I want to try to get really good at skiing this next two years and ski a lot and like have so good time and yeah, progress a bunch and then hopefully in like two years when the next qualification period starts that's when i like hopefully will be motivated to like try go for another one Mm. do you see any potential problems with um the whole national teams and all of that if you compete less and want to get back in or maybe like uh, like for sure like there's a bunch of young swedes that coming up that are super talented which deserves the spot as well. So I think it's that, but I think I'm just going to be aware of it the whole time. Like I for sure going to still follow all the competitions and see like what people are doing and like make yeah. sure I keep up with my skiing. But then, yeah, I, th- I think it's only going to like motivate me. Like what, what I was saying before too, with like prioritize certain events for extra quality over quantity Mm -hmm. and just like i'm gonna probably since i am so competitive of a person i'm gonna definitely miss it too so i'm gonna be like starving to like get my chance to like show what i can do in competitions again and like yeah body wise and everything mentally and everything i feel like i'm still getting better and better all the time so Hopefully, if it keeps going like this, I don't see a reason why I wouldn't be able to get myself in there. So this is it for episode 32 with Henrik Arlo. Be on the lookout for part two dropping really soon. Big thank you to this episode sponsors once again, Axis Board Shop, Planks Clothing, and Adrenaline Urban. Peace. <laughs>